the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Laura Kaminsky, Associate Director of Education, and I'd like to welcome you to the Y for the first evening of our series, Critics on Criticism, Theater. First, I'd like to explain the format for this evening. Following the moderated conversation on stage, there will be an opportunity for you, the members of the audience, to ask questions. As you enter the hall, you are given an index cards upon which to write your questions. About 45 minutes in tonight's program, ushers will walk up and down the aisles, collect the cards, and bring them backstage for presentation. If you didn't get a card, the ushers will bring you blank cards, so we won't have any, any problems with cards. This series developed out of the desire to examine the role and the world of the drama critic to give us a better understanding of the standards and values the critic brings to his or her work, and to learn in the course of these four very special e evenings how three lead leading critics view the state of theater today. And on the final evening, in a sort of rebuttal, how leading producers and directors deal with their concerns. It is our pleasure to have a series moderator, Jane Moss, currently the co-producer of Theater Festival Incorporated, an organization devoted to the production of an international theater festival. Ms. Moss is also serving as the theater consultant for the 42nd Street Redevelopment Project. Formerly, she served as the executive director of the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York, and prior to that, as the managing director of Playwrights Horizons, having come to New York from the center stage in Baltimore. We're delighted that she's here with us for the second season of Critics on Criticism. Our guest tonight is Stanley Kaufman, spelled K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N-N. Somehow, someone always manages to leave out an F or an N. But no matter how it's spelled, everyone knows and respects him. I was told by Mr. Kaufman when he entered the building tonight that his name is spelled correctly, and it's the Wise Concert Hall that spells it wrong. Born in New York in 1916, Mr. Kaufman was graduated from the College of Fine Arts at New York University in 1935. Since 1958, he has been active as a critic, although he also spent 10 years as an actor and stage manager of the Washington Square Players and is the author of seven novels and a very large number of plays. In 1958, he became the film critic for The New Republic and has served as a theater critic as well for 10 years. He is also film critic and theater critic for The Saturday Review. Beyond his criticism and his own writing, Mr. Kaufman has served as visiting professor in the Yale School of Drama and distinguished professor of English teaching drama, critic, film, and literature at York College of the City University of New York. He is the recipient of many prestigious awards and fellowships, including the George Polk Award for Criticism and the annual George Jean Nathan Award. We are honored that he's here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Stanley Kaufman, and our moderator, Jane Moss. Thank you. We're told to bring these over. Huh? Oh, okay. It's like snarling. Just following instructions here. Um, before I begin this interview this evening, um, I just wanted to tell you how pleased I was that the 92nd Street Y invited me back to both continue and I hope extend and expand our shared dialogue about theater criticism. For those of you who attended last year, I have gone to great efforts to make my questions sound different, even though they're the same, um, and have also purchased an entire new wardrobe to distract you from the fact that they are very similar. Um, I, I actually, on a personal level, am very, very heartened at the turnout for this series, um, both last year and this year, and um, amidst all of the doom and gloom about audience attendance on Broadway, I think it is very, very heartening to know that people at least want to talk about the theater, even if they don't want to go see it, um, which I think is a step in the right direction. Um, I am very... 
These are new chairs. We were just told about the new chairs. Um, I am very, very pleased and very honored to have as our guest this evening Stanley Kaufman. Um, for many of my colleagues and myself, um, he has always represented the very, very best that criticism can offer. Um, now I feel like it. Don't yes. interrupt what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> this is also the good part. <laughs> um, and through his uh, unique vision, insight, and intellectual clarity, he has been able to, in my estimation, raise the context within which theater is discussed. Um, he is one of the rare individuals within the theater field that really makes theater look good. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to have him with us this evening. Thank you. Um, my first question for you, Stanley, is I expect that perhaps many of the people in this room know you certainly most recently through your film criticism, and I think it would be valuable if you could expand on what Laura said about your theater background. Well, I was educated for the theater. Uh, I spent four years in the Department of Dramatic Art, as it was then called, at NYU, and growing out of that university college department grew a repertory company called the Washington Square Players, not the, the group so named that became the Theater Guild. They had already become the Theater Guild. But since this theater operated on Washington Square during the winters in theaters leased from NYU and then had a summer place up in the middle of New York State, uh, they used the name. And I was a quite minor actor with them and stage manager. Did everything. I, I did lighting. I uh, uh, selected the records to be used. There were no tapes then to be used, you know, for the entrance of the witches and all. Uh, and uh, because the quarters were so cramped, there was no room backstage to uh, for a light for the stage manager. So. In consequence, and after having sat through many rehearsals with, with the book, I knew endless plays of Shakespeare by heart. And I used to win bets in bars by starting with act one, scene one of Midsummer Night's Dream and going till they cried for mercy or, or, or Macbeth. Now I, I couldn't get a beer, with, but, but <laughs> I used to do very well, just driving people crazy by re reciting a lot of good plays from beginning to end. I did, do you want to hear more of this? Uh, um, <laughs> How did you get into criticism? It's a, it's a, I was going to say a complex story. It's a simple story. Uh, into, if you mean theater and film criticism. Mm -hmm. The theater criticism uh, began actually when a friend of mine named Roland Gillette, who was then uh, on the Saturday Review long ago, this is in, uh, late 40s, early 50s, asked me to review records of performances in a column I did for a while, which I very cleverly called Theater in the Round. <laughs> and uh, I did that for a while and to, to skip a bit. In 1957, 58, I got into film criticism through the Mafia. That's true. <laughs> This is being recorded. I just think this should be uh, the uh, t To sum this up, some of you I know have heard, heard this story more than once, so I'll, I'll make it fast. I was on a jury, a mafia trial, for nine weeks. I was the foreman of the jury. Another member of that jury was a, a, a known film critic, a man named Arthur Knight. I'm sure you all know his name. And we used to have lunch every day for um, nine weeks. And through talking to him, I discovered that I really knew more about film than I thought I had been going voraciously ever since my mother would let me go. Uh, and uh, by coincidence, someone, another magazine asked me to, uh, a magazine asked me to write some film criticism, and I'm going to all that. And I began, but I would never have thought of doing it if it hadn't been for my experience on a mafia jury in company with this film critic. And how did I get back into theater criticism? Oh, yes. I got um, Channel 13. We're now, we're now in the early 60s, 1960s. 
uh, invited me to do a program about film, which I did uh, every week. And while I was there, they, another program on that station asked me to start reviewing plays. And I did that once a week. And uh, some people saw that, and uh, then a newspaper in this city invited me to be their theater critic, which lasted eight months. And after that, I went back to the New Republic. Both, I'm, I'm condensing this uh, stomach aches I'm leaving out. And <laughs> um, as their, uh, as their first their literary critic, then their film and theater critic. I was doing both for 10 years, from 69 to 79. And then uh, their original theater critic, Robert Brustein, was on your program last year, I know, came back, and I, I'm now doing only film criticism for the New Republic. For a while, I went back and did theater criticism for the Saturday Review until it became heaven knows what it is now. Uh, and uh, that's how I got here tonight. Um, a question that I asked all the participants last season, and it's a topic I wish to continue this year as well, is um, I I'm curious as to how you view the relationship between, well, and in particular, I'm talking about theater here, between criticism and the art form that it evaluates. Do you feel that criticism primarily serves the artist, serves your readership, serves to create a climate for the event? Um, you're talking about an ideal situation, yes, not the case. Yes, both. N talk about, I actually would appreciate if you could talk about both. If you start off talking with the well, ideal and then the, the reality. Uh, the reality of criticism is, uh, as the reality of everything is in all the arts, the, ma the majority of it is um, beneath comments, so we won't comment on it. I mean, that's, that's not a snide remark. We all know that to be true, uh, that most of the art that's produced in all the arts is negligible. Uh, and uh, most of the criticism about in, mo in most of the arts is uh, the same. Uh, but to speak, uh, that's not a very daring thing to say. It's just an experiential fact for everyone, I think. Uh, the ideal relationship between the critic, the th it's, it's not tr it's triangular. Uh, is for the uh, critic to be of use to the reader, of use to the reader, to the best reader he can imagine. And while doing that, he ought to try, he, he, not ought to try, he does try to be of use to the artists whom he's writing about and their art in general. I've had lots of kinds of communications from uh, during all the years I've been doing this. And the ones that have made me, I think, happiest is, uh, are the, were those that came from practicing artists of one kind or another, often disagreeing, but taking the trouble to disagree with me. I've always taken that as a certification of, uh, it's my certificate of, of license to practice. I'll never forget the first time that happened. I'd been writing film criticism for uh, two or three years, and an anthology film, one of those collections of, m one of those films made up of snippets of other films came out about Harold Lloyd, who to me, you know, was sort of in Valhalla, but he was still alive, <laughs> actually. And uh, I got a letter from Harold Lloyd about the piece I'd written about him. I thought, well, what else can life do for me? I mean, that, <laughs> uh, but it was a letter that took the trouble, besides saying some pleasant things, took the trouble to uh, explain, to answer a question I'd asked, how in my review, how he had done that. And he, he took two pages to explain at length how they had done this. Was if you know the film Safety Last in which he dangles from the broken clock. It's probably the most famous still in Harold Lloyd's career. And he, he wrote to me and explained to me for two pages how he did it. I mean, they can keep the Nobel Prize. <laughs> they will. <laughs> um, 
you have written for both daily journals, certainly a certain daily publication known as the New York Times, um, as well as the weekly publication that you currently write for. Have you found the pressures of those two different media within the newspaper publication world to be different? Yes. Uh, there, are a lot, there are a lot more uh, kinds of pressure in writing for a newspaper than merely the time pressure. Uh, the, the first pressure is that um, one simply has to ignore if one has any self to respect and wants to keep on respecting it. The first pressure to ignore is the power in that job. It's just absolutely disregard it. And write as if you were writing for the smallest journal published. Then you can last eight months. <laughs> uh, now there um, is a payoff. <laughs> Well, I, no one here is old enough to remember, but I made some fuss about doing opening night reviews when I was there. And at present, uh, I didn't want to do them on opening night. I wanted to go to previews and write later, and mostly I did that, but I had to do some opening night reviews. And at the present moment, I'm writing about the theater for a quarterly, and I've just been invited to write about the theater for a new semi-annual about the theater. <laughs> And a friend of mine said, see, you were belly aching about opening nights. Now it's a semi-annual. <laughs> he listens. <laughs> uh, I don't feel any pressure. I wouldn't use the word pressure about writing for the New Republic. I know there are variegated opinions about that magazine politically. Uh, my own variegated opinions about it began before its present ownership. I just thank a heaven, any heaven you like, that it exists and has been so wonderful, wonderful to me ever since I began writing for them. Uh, by now, working for them has become for me almost metabolic. It's a rhythm of my life to write for them every week. When my wife and I go off on jaunts for two or three weeks, I feel uh, not no, well, yes, anxious, eager to get back to work, but also I feel as if I'm sort of limping. Something's wrong. I'm, I'm not doing something every week that I should be doing. I, I just love it. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. There can't, there can't be any happier condition for uh, a journalist critic. Do you find reviewing plays to, to differ significantly from reviewing movies? Or that the relationship is hard, way different. It's harder to sleep at a play. <laughs> uh, now, is that a statement about plays or is that a statement about movies? <laughs> uh, yes, there are, there are, if you want that question answered seriously, uh, there are uh, wonderful junctures and wonderful dissimilarities uh, between writing uh, the two kinds of criticism. Uh, that in here in the forms themselves, one writing about one always refreshes you to write about the other, and and vice versa, because although they're the obvious similarities, there are enormous differences, enormous differences, uh, in expectation, in method, and actually in the use of your senses. It hardly needs to be explained. It's very deceptive to think that, uh, and it's a deception that everyone, I won't say is prone to, but likes to be prone to, uh, that seeing a film, seeing a play have similarities, because sitting in rows of seats like that, and everyone faces in the same direction. Uh, but uh, what goes on in those seats is very different, and only, only part of it only part of it is owing to the fact that um, in the theater the act, the action, the act is created bef in, before you while you are there. Uh, that's only part of it. Uh, part of it derives from the fact that the actor is to some extent, particularly in comedy, interacting, the, li the live actor with the uh, audience. But. Um, 
it, this is a generality, and, and like all such, it's vulnerable. Uh, everything, everything in a film is more important than everything is in a play. Uh, by and large, I saw a film this week, this past week, called Therese, which is opening in um, New York, December 17th. It's a French film made about uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux, a 19th century French girl. She uh, entered a convent when she was 15 and died when she was 24 of tuberculosis. Exquisite, exquisite. If you remember the song of Bernadette, that's what this is not. <laughs> this is a really exquisite work of art. And it's irrelevant to, to the point I just raised because it's done in a series of almost plaques of action separated from each other by a um, moment of black. Very beautiful and moving film. Uh, and in, in many of the scenes, the shots, the compositions of this film, of an actor or two and a piece of, like us sitting here, we, we two and this table might be all that there was in the shot. And there was a sense that the blackness surrounding them in the shot of the Therese was just as important <laughs> as the people in the, and what they were saying, doing. Uh, um, if that were a scene, if that same identical composition of blackness had, were uh, in a play, there'd be more importance devolving on the two people and what. The, I'm not arguing that that's not important. They're not important in the film. I'm arguing that the blackness in the film is more important than it would be in in a play, by and large. Uh, In, a, in, the, in the theater, we tend, although this, this is a fallacy too, in, in, in practice all the time, we tend to place more weight on the words. Actually, I think it's beginning to change, but we can talk about that later. What's that? I said I think that's beginning to change yes. more and more. Yes. Well, we're, we're conditioned. We have been. To, and in a film um, uh, in the past, and of course I'm not talking about silent pictures, we t we've tended to place relatively speaking, less emphasis on the words. But that raises an interesting point. All of us go to films all the time. And uh, you may or may not agree with me, but I, I feel this very strongly that in, in American film, or American or, or British films, but I don't understand any foreign language well enough to have an opinion on this point, uh, I've found that the, the level of the writing of dialogue has become, in the last 10 or 15 years, very high in terms of naturalism, verism, uh, briskness, point, pungency. Most, I'm not talking about the quality of the films as a whole, but the quality of the dialogue has risen tremendously. There's lots of good, uh, lively, live language being, veristic language, not of any flight or evocation, but uh, amusingly realistic dialogue that you hear in films these days at a level much higher, let's not talk about television, let's much higher than the general level of, of uh, equivalent playwriting, that is to say, realistic representational playwriting. Uh, well, that's enough of that question. Okay, Why should I do all the work? <laughs> let's move on to another question. Um, last year, it's actually oddly enough related to what you've been saying, however, which is that last year, uh, Walter Kerr noted that for him, um, the actor and the actor's performance really stood at the center of the theatrical experience. And when you read Walter Kerr's uh, criticism, I think that you realize that much of his analysis of a play or a production is really revealed through the prism of his descriptions of actors' performances. And I was wondering what for you is at the center of the theatrical experience? Well, in spite of what I've just said, uh, I couldn't select one item uh, 
I couldn't select one item and hold it up the, uh, as the uh, criterion by which one judges a play. I, by the way, um, I have lots of differences with Walter Kerr, and some of them appear in print, but uh, I certainly do agree that uh, in my experience of reading American, American critics, he has been one of the most acute on the subject of acting. Mm -hmm. His, inter his other interests are not mine, but uh, he certainly has been uh, an acute critic of acting. Uh, well, I love acting, too. And uh, in the uh, teaching I've, I've done, still doing, I try to, which always has something to do, something to do with criticism, I've tried to uh, underline that interest and inculcate it in the people who are good enough to listen to me. Uh, but I couldn't say that uh, I go to the theater to see, to, to see acting, uh, except if it's um, a revival of a play, that's a big exception, and then one goes to see whatever new has been brought to bear on uh, a familiar play, uh, directing and uh, all the other matters we know about uh, included. For example, uh, those who know me know that I'm a Shaw maniac and uh, done seminars in Shaw, one year seminars for some time, hope to continue doing. Uh, I'm not saying this to be uh, ugly, just to your point. I refuse to go to see You Never Can Tell, which I think is a great comedy. Uh, the best high comedy since Sheridan, in my view, because I know uh, the work of that director in Shaw. I've seen three productions of Shaw by him, and I'm not uh, going to suffer through another massacre. Uh, that's prejudgment, but that, but what, or, 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 that's not. Yes, it's prejudice. That's what prejudgment means. But in this case, prejudice based on experience. It's an answer to your question because uh, it has to do with um, uh, what one looks for or listens to at a, at, a, at a production of a play. The real answer to that question is uh, you never know in advance. Uh, what Diaghilev said to Stravinsky, I need not quote, uh, the theater we want to do to us. Uh, and the happiest experience, experiences we've all had in the theater are when, uh, have been when what we didn't expect, or didn't expect to that degree, uh, astonishes us and scars the cortex in a happily unforgettable way. Uh, it's not a question of going there to see in order of priority A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes one goes to see um, a, well, one comes away from a play with a, a quite unexpected order of response. At the screen, the, 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 may I go on one? Mm -hmm. At the screening of, uh, trying to stop me, at, at, uh, <laughs> at the um, I'll screening your microphone. of Therese I was talking about, uh, that I went to this week, there was an actor there named John Voigt. He just happened to come to the screen. I don't know him, I didn't speak to him. Uh, I admire him tremendously. He's an ex extraordinarily gifted man. And seeing him, I remembered something that is to your point. There was a play that he was in, in the 1950s, maybe late 1950s or so, called That Summer, That Fall by a man named Frank Gilroy. And it was a, a modern reworking of the uh, Hippolytus legend. Do you know them? The widowed father marries a new wife and the father's grown son and the wife, etc. <laughs> uh, the uh, was set in an Italian-American family, you know, in New York. And, um, the father was played by a, a charming, stout Italian actor named Richard Castellano, 
the mother was Irene Papas, and the father's son, not, not, the, not the mother, the father's wife was Irene Papas, and the son was John Voigt. I can't remember one word of that play. I just, when I think of that production, I get goosebumps thinking of those three actors, just thinking of those actors. I didn't go there to see the acting. Uh, but uh, these are the unfortunately rare, but uh, infinitely rewarding prizes in the boxes of dismal crackerjack. I uh, want to slightly shift the subject here, um, but it does tie into what you were saying about the level of the, the ri seeming rising level of um, screenwriters or scripts for film. Um, in your collection of essays, theater criticism, this is always a part where I feel like I'm on Johnny Carson. I should be holding up the book in order <laughs> to, you know, sell. Um, and you should have order slip. <laughs> exactly. I should, order, so I should have this little display here on the table. Um, you expressed a fairly grim assessment of the current state of American playwriting, um, and you stated um, that virtually none of basically sort of the current crop of American playwrights has, quote, written one play of wholly achieved quality and lasting consequence, unquote. Um, could you, you remember the date? I'm serious. Do you not remember the date of that? Uh, yeah, well, that was my. I think okay. it was like in, yeah, in the late 70s. Um, and and my question is a two-part one. Number one, if you could amplify that assessment for the audience, and whether you had changed your mind in the intervening years. Yeah. Um, as long as it's understood, we're talking about playwriting because that's a different thing from talking about the state of the theater. Right. On no, two. very specifically, yeah. playwriting. Uh, I can think of two or three or four plays that I've seen since I wrote that, that more than that, that I think very highly of, fully American play. Right. Um, did I say fully complete, fully realized? Like, uh, if that means perfect, I don't think any of these plays... Fully achieved quality. Fully achieved, well, pretty darn well fully achieved. I think immediately of... Um, Sam Shepard's The Tooth of Crime, and I think also of uh, David Mamet's uh, Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross, which I thought was first class piece of work. Other plays of, of uh, Mamet's like uh, The Water Engine. Uh, uh, there are several plays of Mamet's that I think very highly of, I didn't know at this time, and other plays of Shepard's, not his early short plays, but some of his longer works. Um, True West, I like very much. Uh, I can't think offhand, but I'm a very bad thinker offhand, a very poor recall that picking it out of uh, thin air, uh, of any other American plays that have meant a great deal to me since I wrote. Yes, I can think of one other. And uh, this uh, draws hoots from my friends, but. Uh, if there are any of them here, I expect to hear the hoots. Uh, this play, though it came from England and is set in England, is written by an American, and that's The Elephant Man, which I think is a, a lovely, symbolic piece of work with flaws, less, less fully achieved than some of the others we've talked about, but a very moving and uh, visionary piece of work that uses an actual incident as a catapult for large speculation. What do you perceive as being the obstacles to... The what? The obstacles for American playwrights sort of coming to fruition? I don't know that the, I can answer that. It would vary very much from person to person. And I don't want to be blithe about uh, a lot. I know a lot of American playwrights younger ones particularly, who are trying very hard, and uh, I don't want to be the Lord High Executioner chopping off heads. Uh, and, you know, ad, ad libitum, but, but um, and nor can that be a, um, a cross-section answer to that question. Every playwright's problems are his or her own. Uh, 
if there were an answer, if one wanted a hazard, if one were forced at gunpoint to deliver an answer to that question. Am I holding a gun? <laughs> I was wanted to say something about frisking her off stage before we came on, but these are sacred prince precincts. Um, well, it, it, these statements are going to get a bit large. One of the things that playwrights have complained to me about a great deal, oh, frequently, it's just in conversation, uh, is the lack of uh, an audience in the sense of not knowing, I'm talking about serious writers, of course, uh, not knowing for whom they are writing and not having any, not guarantees or contracts, but any social or or cultural assurance of a medium through which to reach those people. Uh, if you compare that situation with a situation that's long past and probably well long past, I mean, all to the good, when before the competition, the strong competition of films and television and so on, there were many theaters and many plays and the, the people went to the theater because primarily there's no place else to go to, and a playwright, at whatever level, was working for uh, a recognizable targeted audience all his life long. And that's why so many of those playwrights at a not very high level often were very productive. And the, co the converse of that is why so many playwrights today feel stymied, feel stalked. They, uh, they start with youthful bursts of enthusiasm, I'm not discussing levels of talent, uh, and then they, something good or less good or fine happens to them, and they find that uh, there's nothing incremental about it. They're not, unless the, we're talking about an exception like, uh, well, Neil Simon on one hand or Shepard on a very different hand. Nothing builds for them. I, we had dinner, my wife and I, the other night with a very talented man who has been, we know, for, known for a long time, who uh, has been writing for plays for 15 years, has had some produced. Is, I'm not going to identify him any further. Uh, he's a produced playwright and recognized one. And he feels that he's not standing on ethics. If he'd, been a, if he'd been a surgeon for 15 years, he would now be a surgeon 15 years on with all the uh, increments of reputation and uh, uh, access to, to uh, interesting work and to fulfillment that went, or a lawyer, pick anything you like, an insurance broker, anything. Uh, but that doesn't happen in our theater nowadays. That doesn't explain, nothing explains. Uh, nothing can explain why uh, we have no genius popping up in our midst. But I do think, I'm, this is maybe sentimental, I do think that there is a connection between uh, social appetite and social opportunity on one hand and the production of uh, uh, good art, great art on the other. One of the reasons Unquestionably, one of the reasons that the great Italian opera composers appeared in the 19th century is because there was an absolutely voracious appetite for operacious. Hundreds of new operas were produced every year in Italy. Of course, out of every hundred, 101 were no good or didn't survive, jokingly speaking. Uh, but because that appetite existed, of uh, all the names you know, capped with Verdi, uh, came into being in a country that had no appetite for opera at, uh, at that level, with that intensity. Verdi might have been a, a church organist or a pizza cook or something, but, but, but because the uh, one could say not too fastfully that the Italian people and their interest in opera made him a genius.
Uh, you could then turn that on me and say, well, since there was the appetite for theater for so many centuries before these other means of uh, entertainment or enlightenment came along, why aren't there more geniuses? I can't answer that, but we wouldn't have the geniuses of the, of the theater we, that we, playwriting geniuses that we have had without that appetite. I just want to just quickly quote something you said about uh, various British playwrights that you're very admiring of, because um, I think it's related to what we're talking about here, which is, this was again in, in the collection of essays, Theater Criticism, where you were in, it was a review of a Carol Churchill production, actually. And you were talking about her and Howard Brinton and David Hare and other writers of that circle and generation. And you noted that these writers were... Um, exhibited, uh, and I quote, rootedness in a culture, a culture that infuriates them and has moved them to levels of playwriting that almost no contemporary U.S. playwright can approach. Do you think that another thing that is curiously absent in America is a kind of absence of external constraints? There's no rigid class structure to rebel against. There is, by and this is certainly not true of all American playwrights, but there is a certain kind of economic hardship that many playwrights do not experience or experience, they certainly don't, in many cases, experience extreme poverty. And there's no real, well, depending on your point of view about Reagan, there is no real political oppression to rebel against. I don't think there's anything wrong with anything you've said as a reason, but I think there are some other things that might be said. Um, this is on the assumption that I'm right, or at least I'm going to argue the point that uh, in the last 20 years, uh, British playwriting has been better than American playwriting on a level. I, th I would certainly subscribe to that. Uh, I used to know a novelist named Walker Percy, a wonderful writer, and uh, when he won his uh, National Book Award for the movie goer, he was asked in some interview why uh, so much good writing in America came out of the South. And he said, we got beat. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, Britain got beat in the last war. Uh, she was absolutely disemboweled economically in vic a real, a real Pyrrhic victory. Uh, this is not intended to be a, a, a flag, any kind of flag waving remark, but it's quite true for, that for a lot of obvious reasons, the country that lost the war, uh, by the, which by the way has produced a great deal of wonderful literature itself and plays since the war, Germany, some of my favorite living writers are German language writers, novelists and playwrights and poets, uh, but compared with, they, they Britain has been reeling ever since they quote one. And out of that uh, terribly costly victory came all kinds of economic and social dislocations and, and uh, disappointments and, and bitternesses in which this generation of uh, playwrights we're talking about grew up, some of them born after the war or might as well have been as, as sentient beings. That's point one about them. Another point is that I think this is a, a fact that contributes. It's not an arguable fact. It's a fact that contributes. Is that they live in a relative, relatively homogeneous country in which uh, their language is more important to them. And I'm talking about bus drivers and lorry drivers, as well as Oxford Duns, than it is to most Americans. This is not inverse of parochialism, it's simply, I think, an observable fact. Uh, put those two factors alongside of some of the things you mentioned in your question, and you have seeded there a, a hothouse of uh, possibilities. And most of these writers whom you've mentioned are writers of, um, who are out to glorify 
even though they wince. Would you, if you would, if I said it to one once, and he did wince. You glorify the language, which is really the language and the form, which are really all they can depend on in a, in a world, in a, in a culture they describe, to despise a culture they despise, and can do it because they feel they are emissaries of that culture whose uh, options for change, whose urges to change, have some moment. Most of them are uh, very left politically. Uh, and sometimes their writing is, uh, in some degree, uh, prescribed in an almost mechanical way by that leftism. Which is, that's not a political opinion, it's an uh, uh, aesthetic one. But when they're at their best, they are wonderful. I know of few plays written since, what, what cutoff date am I going to pick? I'll pick Pinter in um, English language writing better than a, a play by Howard Brenton called Sore Throats. He's a very political writer. That happens to be the least political play. I think it's an absolutely wonderful play. The, logical successor to Strindberg's Dance of Death as a, a drama of marital anguish. And uh, uh, he's written poetry along those lines, too. He has a play opening this month at the Manhattan Theatre Club called Bloody Poetry, which is about, I believe, uh, Shelley and Keats. I can't wait to see it. Uh, he's as good an example as any of the people you've mentioned. David Hare at his best, uh, some others, of people who, with you might, it, it, it's a nice paradox, with almost old fashioned lap, lapidary ingenuity, build structures against the culture that they, that comes out of the culture and is aimed against the culture that nourishes them. I'm not talking about ingratitude, I'm talking about a natural process, a right process, a justified process. And there isn't, for me, that kind of um, generative strength and hatred in America for many of these writers. That's, I'm not, not uh, advocating all writers, or any writers, to be political. Lots of the best plays in Britain are not overtly political. Sore throats in one. Uh, but um, she's selling programs? Yes, you're being upstaged by the um, questions. Um, but I, a, a playwright in America, uh, this is an incurable fact. Um, why, in a sense, why shouldn't want to cure it? Uh, never feels that he's writing of America. Mamet writes of Chicago, Shepard writes of the Southwest or the West, or the California, Southern California. Uh, and uh, when they're at their best, they say some things about those, out of those regions that speaks to everyone, naturally, just as the, the British playwrights say something of meaning to us. But there's a sense of rattling around in a box that I get from uh, many American writers. And this playwright I mentioned before who feels that he hasn't arrived anywhere after 15 years of writing, fairly successful writing, said something the other night, uh, talking about himself and mostly about other playwrights. There's no, no sense of being born up and representing the history behind you, the history of your country. Now, none of those things is the equivalent of or a substitute for or replacement for talent. And uh, the interesting thing about talent is that, so far as we know, because we, we don't know about all the talents that haven't surfaced, uh, but that when it does surface, it is visible, it's usually unstoppable. Make a list for yourself sometime. I did this once and have it with me of all the playwrights who came out of conferences and, uh, you know, writing conferences and foundations and grants and so on, and all the ones who did not, 
And it's a curious fact that the best ones never went to a con playwriting conference, never got a grant, never did anything of that kind. The ones who were pampered and cosseted and given all kinds of workshops and tryouts here and there are, you know, they're sort of uh, hopefuls, remain hopefuls. The really gifted ones, in a sense, sometimes uh, avoid that often avoid any kind of uh, pampering. That's not an argument against grants. I've had grants. I love them. <laughs> uh, 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 it's just a fact that um, Shepard and Mamet, to name only those two, never went to a playwriting conference or a foundation or or a playwriting school. I also think it's of interest that David Mamet, who recently spoke here at the 92nd Street Y, I believe de virtually declared his abandonment of the theater and that he would now his be... What? His abandonment of the theater and he would now be almost exclusively writing for film, um, which in a way ties into what you were observing earlier, which is that the level of screenwriting is beginning to improve. I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know him. I don't know anything about his reasons. Uh, I do know, by the way, that he teaches acting at NYU, or did. Uh, I don't know. It would be pure guesswork to comment on that. I'm, I'm deeply sorry to hear it because uh, he's he's one of the playwriting voices that can be heard as a playwright, and uh, in our country, uh, the conditions of filmmaking are so strictured, so worried, so nervous that uh, the playwright is, uh, no matter how gifted he is, is uh, just one more uh, colleague on a team and not often a primary one. Uh, I've seen some of Mamet's screenplays and they don't seem to represent his best self, I, but that's I, maybe he's going to do some other things, he's going to direct. That's a curious thing, by the way. Uh, if you see as many films as I do and uh, write about at least some of them, you become very aware. This is not a 100% black and white division. You become very aware that um, in America, virtually without exception, the screenplay is written by one man and the direction is done by another. The director always has some visible or invisible effect on the screenplay, but it's never his screenplay. And very often in other countries, most other countries, uh, the, the uh, director does his own work, films his own work, directs his own work. Uh, one of the best examples, I know this is the question you were going to ask, that the, the, uh, um, one of the best films I saw last year was written and directed by a man you mentioned, David Hare, a film called Weatherby. I have one more question of mine before I get into your questions, which is um, perhaps this is a development coming out of the somewhat perilous, current perilous state of American playwriting, which is, I think in America there is an increasing interest in the role of the director, and there is an increasing... Um, theater directors? Theater, I'm talking about theater, yeah, theater directors. And that increasingly one is seeing productions of directors who impose their own vision and concept onto a play in sometimes startling and unanticipated ways. Um, and often this vision is either at odds with or totally ignores the intentions of the text. By and large, these directors are either coming out of the world of the avant-garde or they um, are coming here or have been transplanted here from Europe. Um, my question for you is that these directors and their interpretations of the text often generate great controversy. And you, I think, address this issue quite eloquently in your review of Andre Chabon's production of The Cherry Orchard. And I was wondering if you could talk about this issue of relationship between director and text and radical interpretation of text for the audience. Uh, it's an interesting question. 
<laughs> we're laughing. That's what people always we're, say. we're laughing because she quoted that line to me as, as, being, as having been responded yes. to her very many times by one of her guests last previous guests. Yes. Who always said my question was, my question was interesting, and then he proceeded not to answer the question. Um, most most often, of course, that subject has been uh, discussed is being discussed all the time, and most often it's being discussed in terms of the present situation, which seems to me short-sighted. I think that that's the way I talked about it in that review of the cherry orchard. I don't think that's the way one can look at it. One has to look at it historically. Uh, not many people who haven't studied the subject know that the profession of the director is relatively new. It's only a little bit over uh, 100 years old as a profession. In the theater, we're talking about the theater. And, um, if you made a um, one of those high school graphs of the history of the theater from Athens to today, and let's say that graph were one foot long, the director would enter about one quarter of an inch from the end, uh, and he was he. By now, we must also say happily she, uh, but he originally was obviously very badly wanted unconsciously by the theater and by the culture because the profession zoomed into prominence very quickly. By the turn of the ce this century, uh, the director began to be an eminence. And no sooner than that did that begin to happen than the director, some directors, began to uh, take uh, precedence over everything else in the, over the play. It began to uh, upset the uh, tradition of the actors and director when he appeared, where they had to interpret the author's work. It began to evolve in one half, at least, of uh, theater work, that the play was there to be at the service of the theater artists, making a distinction between the writer, distinction between the writer and the theater artist. And they have come down to us uh, from very shortly after the turn of the century uh, two traditions of directing. One of them you might call the Stanislavski tradition. We have a Stanislavski expert in the audience, I know, uh, which is based in the healthiest way in the livest, most nourished way, on the traditional way of doing plays, which is the one we're all most familiar with, that the purpose is to, for the, the director and the cast to serve the script, new or old, in the same way that uh, an orchestra and a conductor serve a score. And then there's the other school, which uh, dates from Meyerhold, who was uh, you could say a contemporary of Stanislavski, although he began as his young, one of his young actors and branched out away from it. This theatricalist view of theater productions, that the theater took whatever goods it could get to make its art. And uh, most of the authors, uh, most of them were dead, whom Mayahol produced in his various theaters, in, uh, first in Tsarist Russia and then in the Soviet Union, would have been horrified by what this kind of genius did to their work. And from both those founts have flowed two streams. Uh, and we are now at the nether end of those currents. And to talk about it as a new phenomenon is simply to be blind to the history of the 20th century and to be blind to the, um, the needs for the second, originally heterodox, but now simply different orthodoxy of uh, taking the play as the uh, basis for a production to be made, which may or may not represent the author's intention. Uh, the matter of choosing between one or the other is uh, to say I am for root A or I am for root B is ridiculous. 
uh, unless you happen to be the author of the play in question. <laughs> uh, I can very well see why. I mean, I, I've had experience, not personal experience, but a first hand observation experience of a new play being done by um, a Maya Hole descendant and the author insisting that there be a notice in the program that this play was not done according to his design, his intent. Uh, one of the most startling productions I've ever seen in my life was the production of the Mar Assad play by Peter Brook, a production I'll never forget. I'm sure that at least some of you uh, saw that. Uh, for many people in the theater, it was a eye opener, the, the, their inspiration in a sense. As it happens, uh, at, the, at that time, which was 1966, uh, Peter Weiss, the author, came to this country and I was asked to interview him on television, Channel 13, and a very gentle man. And in his very gentle way, he got across that he was horrified at Peter Brooks' production, that the uh, original production in Germany, directed by a man named Svinarski and other productions he had seen, including Ingmar Bergman's production in Stockholm, were very much more what he wanted. And he, he was not an a aggressive man. Uh, he implied that his work had been used by Peter Brook for a kind of self-advancement, advancement of oneself's ideas at any rate. Now, uh, how is one to choose arbitrarily and finally between those two views? Uh, I would feel poorer if I had never seen Peter Brook's production. On the other hand, if I were Peter, Peter Weiss, uh, I would feel, well, why did I spend two years laboring over that manuscript, insisting on this and polishing this and spending two weeks wondering whether he should reach with his right hand or his left hand if uh, the director's going to come along and have him roll on the floor? <laughs> uh, well, I don't have to spell it out any further. So I think that in this, um, there are two sides in this question, and I stand firmly on both of them. <laughs> but I also think there is the rare instance where there can be incredible directorial vision in it with an incredible sort of visual and oral vocabulary that also serves the text. I mean, I think that's sort of the best. Are you of, thinking of an instance? Well, what leaps to my mind was Giorgio Strahler's production of The Tempest, where... Oh, that's, where, well, that's... Go ahead. There, where there was remarkable personal vision on the part of the director and where the director was very much a presence in the production. Um, and yet it was in total service of the play. That's uh, the happiest instance you could have picked. Let's make believe it spontaneous as if we hadn't rehearsed it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There was a wonderful... We only rehearsed it <laughs> once. <laughs> uh, there was a... Not incidentally, there was a wonderful review essay written about uh, that production by a young woman named Alisa Solomon in the village. The voice that I clipped and... Uh, I, uh, I mean, it's a, an anthology piece. It is... Um, it is a... Look, the, if there's such a thing as an answer to the question that we've been talking about, that is it. It's not, there's no such thing as an answer, but it does do what you said it does. If there were, if there are any here who were blessed enough to have seen that production, uh, I think they'll recognize at once what Jane and I are talking about. It was a production of uh, the play, anyone who, in Italian, of course, by his Strailer's Theatre, uh, which uh, is based in Milan. I've never seen them play in Milan, but I've been in the theatre itself. It's called the Piccolo Teatro, and it is a, it is a little theatre. The stage itself is not a great... It's certainly no wider and perhaps a bit deeper than this platform here, and they've made that theatre from that small locus an important force in the uh, European world of the theatre. Uh, the text, we all know the Tempest, so you don't need, you, we didn't need to know Italian. 
the text was there and unviolated in any way and not tricked. The characters were all played as Shakespeare's characters. Uh, but I, maybe I should say and. Strahler being an extremely acute, sensitive, and uh, contemporary man could not do a traditional production of The Tempest, which in essence this was, without making it a modern production of The Tempest. That is, everything in Shakespeare, that he was, he was looking for what Shakespeare wanted, what Shakespeare wanted, not what Strahler wanted. And it was found by him and realized by him in ways that seemed to convey the air we were breathing, not trying to recreate of uh, Elizabeth, Elizabethan uh, atmosphere or 19th century atmosphere or trying to approximate, as some uh, traditional directors do, some an unreal ideal performance of the play that exists off somewhere and you judge the production by whether it gets near that platonic, I fixed centuries old idea. No, he was making his own new production of Shakespeare's play. And of uh, by the way, it was his third production of The Tempest that he's done with this, this theater, for, um, in the, which he's had since the end of the World War. He, after he uh, came out of World War II, by the way, he began as a critic in Milan. Hmm. It was a very effective one. D directed a few plays and had to make up his mind whether to continue as a critic or become a director. Well, he fell. <laughs> um, and I, I think I told you this. Uh, I got chills up my spine when I went home and looked up a program. I'd seen one previous production of Strailers. I have a book, an Italian book, full of pictures of all the things. He's directed almost all the productions at this day. They've done everything, everything. I mean, Greeks, Tennessee Williams, Molière, everything. New plays, everything. And uh, the one previous production I had seen of his was um, Brecht's Three Penny Opera, Brecht Weil, Three Penny Opera, which for some reason in Italian is called the Four Penny Opera. I don't understand <laughs> it. It's L'Opera dei Quattro Soldi. Some banker must have worked that out. Uh, I saw it, 19, <laughs> saw it in 1956, and I had the program somewhere, pulled it out, and the actor who had played Prospero the night before in Purchase was the actor who had played Mac Heath in 1956. That explains something, huh? Okay, we are now addressing the questions from the audience. Um, how do you oh, you've got them. Yes, I have them and everything. Um, how do you prepare for a theatrical review? Do you read pre-opening articles or out-of-town reviews or any sort of pre-opening -publici pre publicity materials? Uh, depends on the play. If it's um, a known play and a published play, uh, almost certainly take a look at it and some things about it before I go before I go to see it again if I have seen it before but some, some kind of refreshment if it's a, a brand new play there's uh, nothing to do but open yourself to it uh, but there are, there are always things to be aware of uh, e even with a new play uh, which you can refresh yourself bef about beforehand or, or corroborate later uh, the uh, history of uh, the designer, the, the designer's record, the, the, the director's record, the, the costume designer, the lighting person, the, often a woman these days, uh, etc. There are um, matters about which it's helpful to, to be aware when you see a play, and uh, the more experience you have, uh, the more you have to bear on the instance. Do you think, this is the $64,000 question, uh, do you think that a good critic and good criticism is an art independent, 
Independent or equal to the art it is criticizing? Independent, yes. Uh, if the criticism is equal to the art that it's um, criticizing, the art is not as healthy as it ought to be. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, mean, I, don't, I don't feel that the little review I wrote of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, superb though it was, <laughs> uh, was the equivalent of um, Mamet's play. But to pursue that question a little further, uh, I think that criticism is an art in the best hands. We're only talking about the best people. Uh, and that uh, it creates any... It, if you've ever read any criticism of, of, of worthy people in book form or otherwise, uh, you know this, that criticism creates a para-literature, a literature of its own. Uh, if you read the... Uh, I'm not talking only about uh, theoretical criticism or uh, criticism of dramatic literature. If you read past performance criticism, criticism of past performances by a master, like Shaw, you'll, uh, ooh, besides a few other things that he did in his life, was the greatest theater critic ever to write in English. Uh, you know that that is true. That's my cue to bring something out, uh, if I may. I jotted down something, and it's to the question you've just asked. Uh, recently there was published a an essay by a wonderful young critic named W.D. King, whom some of us here know. Uh, an astonishing essay on one review that Shaw wrote of a production of Henry Irving's, a play called A Story of Waterloo, a one-act play by Conan Doyle, the Sherlock Holmes film. Uh, not to describe the play at length, it has to do with a, a one, this is about 1898 or something, about a, a 100 year old veteran of Waterloo and his last moments, how he dies, a real tearjerker that everyone thought was wonderful and about which Shaw wrote a surgically sharp and utterly knowing review. And King spent a good deal of time thinking about that review, reading the, the original play and writing then about analyzing the review that Shaw wrote. And he said towards the end of that essay something I think applies to that question and would be of interest. Shaw realized the full sense of dramatic criticism by making criticism genuinely dramatic instead of assisting the closure of the work in memory elaborating its impressions with description and evaluation, Shaw reopened the work to further play, taking positions or parts according to the premises of the work and testing the resultant conclusions against a hard and responsible logic. Shaw operates on the reader's memory and understanding, using a play's performance as a pretext, pretext, literally, for the exposure of the artifices that lie behind the seemingly natural process, the artifices that lie behind the seemingly natural process of apprehending a performance, and by extension, any human action. That seems to me wonderful, that crit King's remarks, that if criticism is worthwhile, it not only doesn't seal off that play from you and tie it up and put it on the shelf. It opens the play afresh for you, makes at least what is pertinent and valuable about the play and about the critics' comments on it live with you rather than a uh, sort of filing drawer that you can shove it in. And further, if the criticism is of value, by extension, it applies sooner or later subtly or openly, consciously or unconsciously, to life. 
That's something of a credo for a critic. They, they, we, don't achieve it any more often, that kind of perfection, than uh, other mortals. But it's something uh, to believe in and to work for and about. Uh, can critics really, this is a seemingly 14 part question. Can critics really be trained? What is the best kind of training for young aspiring writers about the theater? And how did Harold Lloyd do that? What's the last word? What's, what? And how did Harold Lloyd do that? <laughs> this poor person has been sitting in the audience waiting uh, for this question to be read. Can critics be trained? Yes. Uh, I, I, I sincerely believe and I'm forced to believe because I spent 17 years helping to train some. Uh, I don't think that they or I think it was a complete waste of time. Uh, they can be trained as any kind of artist can be trained. Uh, not made, but trained. Uh, which is to say, carefully. Uh, with the uh, the sole intent not of imposing matters on the uh, younger critic, but uh, of evoking his or her, helping to evoke his or her innateness. Uh, yes is the answer, that, but it's, it's, a, it's a conditional answer as any kind of artistic training is. If, if any of you have studied singing, you know that to the play of singing teachers around who can ruin you forever. And uh, there are proportionately uh, as many teachers of criticism who could do the same. The teaching of criticism, that, that phrase is, is very odd. The helper of young critics is something that is more pertinent. Yes, it can be. If one believes in criticism as an art, and I do, believes it's a talent as valid as any other talent in the arts, as I do, yes. Uh, what was the rest? Harold Lloyd. <laughs> Harold Lloyd. Oh, he explained in detail. Uh, I had said that I thought there must be some sort of, there must have been some sort of insert. You remember, he's, he climbs up, a, or he's caught on a skyscraper, and he's clinging to the hands of the clock, and suddenly the whole huge clock, cl a tower clock, and the whole face of the clock falls outward towards me, hanging on. Uh, I thought it would have been shot against... Um, uh, rear projection shots of the street below. So he said, no, that they rigged nets below that. And he really took those chances. In fact, um, he took lots of chances. Because, uh, part of one of his hands was blown off you know, by a, a, a bomb that was in a picture, exploded too soon. And he, for most of his life, he had a sort of rubber composition portion of his hand here. Hmm. How do you see the accomplishment of Sam Shepard to the American theater? What are his major strengths and weaknesses? Is the word that comes to my mind first when I think of him, not uniquely to him, but certainly, certainly to him, is voice, is voice the idea of voice. I hear his voice. Uh, and that means that he writes in a way that, I won't say inimitable, because others are imitated, but that uh, is valid with him. He, uh, it's a curious thing about that, that until a shepherd came along, and this is a generalization, faulty, but I, impressionistically true, until uh, shepherd came along, certainly from the time of Tennessee Williams to now, the height of Tennessee Williams to now, most visible American playwriting, I don't know if it was actually always being written around the country, most of it was, we could see, had to do with cities. Usually the eastern seaboard, sometimes Chicago or other, but cities. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I had written on a some, little something on that subject that, uh, Playwrights never seemed to get outside cities. That there was, uh, we were getting films from good films from other countries and some plays that had to do with uh, the lives of other kinds of people. 
Then Shepard appeared and altered that. There have been other, other kinds of uh, plays written in the American theater since then. Uh, he was a kind, one of the things he did for me, and I think for many others, was to insist that there was something lurking, dangerous, D.H. Laurentian in America still. Don't be so smug in your wall-to-wall -wall carpetings. There's a beast under it. And that beast is more visible in Southern California or in Arizona than it is there. But it's, it's, it's a national beast. And it's, uh, as expressed by me, it's a beast with a song that I'm going to sing. A harsh, threatening, alluring song. That's a lot of words, but I really do believe it. Oh, is there any more to that question? No, I think that sums it up quite well. Um, when have you made an error in your criticism, and what have you done about it? I think another way of phrasing this question is, have you ever changed your mind? Well, thank heaven, the second part came, I was going to say, move on to the next question. <laughs> um, yes, oh well, of course, yes. The worst thing about it is that um, for a critic, uh, it's in print. And it's been, sometimes been in print a long time. The example that comes to mind first for me is not in the theater, it's in film. If I had to pick my biggest critical myopia, the most blatant one, uh, and not a small one either, it's a, with a big subject, a film subject. It would be my response to most of uh, Godard's films in the 1960s. I liked the first one, Breathless, very much, and I was chintzy, I think, now about many of the others that came along, in the, not all, but many of the others that came along in the 60s. I think that was really stodgy of me. I can justify myself because I was I was uh, struck by, still am more and more struck by, the work of Antonioni, which was coming along at the same time, and which was uh, organized aesthetically quite differently, almost against Godard. I think that may have helped to blind me. But uh, I'm able now, without losing one iota of uh, awe about Antonioni, to see that uh, Godard was an important man, and as possible, is an important man still in the sense that his films live. Uh, I'm, I wish I could erase some of those earlier reviews. Um, how would you prioritize the functions of a critic? One, eating. <laughs> uh, That's uh, less facetious than it did not sound. Um, <laughs> because uh, critics must have, uh, to be a critic, you must have a, uh, an audible voice. Uh, not necessarily uh, national television, I hope not national television, or a national magazine or so on, something else. But some place where some people you respect for whom you are writing can read you. Uh, but that's uh, not what's been asked here. Uh, the prime function of a critic, absolutely prime function of a critic, without which any experience, any wisdom, any insight, any writing talent are to me irrelevant and almost offensive, is uh, the impulse, the injunction to be helpful, to be helpful centrally and initially to the art, secondly to the reader, and thirdly to the, to the artist. If there's uh, anything I dislike, can't stand, 
it's a criticism that is an exercise of the self-interest of the critic or of critical jousting among critics, which goes on to an enormous degree among theoretical critics these days, particularly of literature, of uh, which they try to make points on each other in the interpretation of French doctrine. Uh, I'm not talking about show shop consumers, consumer guide. I don't mean that remotely by helpfulness. I mean that if the critic has a, a central imperative, it's to be naked before the work and to take all that that work imposes on him in the best nakedness he can bring to bear of mind and spirit and experience and sub submissiveness and to deal with what happens to him out of the experience in such a way that he enhances the possibilities of the work for the viewer or reader or whatever it may be. I take, uh, I I'm not, don't blush for using terms like that because I take criticism seriously. The Y is presently hosting a series. I of, didn't hear the beginning. Uh, the Y here yeah, oh. um, is presently having a series of playwrights discussing the transposition of their plays into film. Could you give us your thoughts on that kind of conversion? Again, um, this was written by a 92nd Street Y staff member <laughs> <laughs> from the marketing department. Again, it's a ma it's a matter of instances rather than of postulates. Uh, I've seen. Well, there's a historical aspect to this too. The history of film, the history of film, film making, is in very considerable measure the history of adaptations. There, ha there simply haven't been enough uh, use of, at whatever period of time you tick. Uh, there haven't been a, hasn't been enough good original material to keep the film more fed. And uh, most of the work has been adaptations from novels or, or from plays. And the, the uh, good, good proportion, I think, one would find if one worked it out on a computer, would be that it was, the, the, the majority came from plays. This, uh, in terms of form, and in terms of terms of realization, has proved in many cases to be deceptive. A kind of false analogy we were talking about before of the closeness of relationship between the film and the play, simply because they sit in the same order of seats and um, there's a raised thing in front of them at both occasions. As every uh, one who's ever worked on a screenplay knows, and as every uh, many viewers have sensed, uh, plays are harder to adapt to fluent film form than fiction, prose fiction, and the novel is harder to adapt than the short story. Uh, of course, the novel, li even the, the leanest of, of uh, novels lives by a kind of prolixity that would be intolerable in a good film. But still it has an advantage over adaptations from plays, usually, because uh, it's cursive. It runs in the same, figuratively speaking, the way a uh, film runs and a play plays build in one place, whereas films, although you see them in the same aperture, really go from place to place that laterally. Um, There's no answer to that question. There are just instances you, you, you can think of. Uh, most plays, that's con uh, Broadway hits and that sort of play that get adapted to films, are, as they say, opened up. You know, if she says, uh, when she comes in, I just flew in from Chicago and boy am I tired. Uh, you see her flying in from Chicago and uh, getting off at the airport and so on. That's supposed to make it a film. Uh, some of the best adaptations of 
plays on film that I know have done have resolutely refused to do that to uh, Pinter plays uh, the caretaker and the homecoming were filmed ex almost exactly by staying relatively within the precincts of the play and and going for depth rather than for extension uh, there's a a very good film of a, a play that was shamefully abused and bruised when it played briefly in New York, an English play called Stevie that uh, was done here at the Manhattan Theatre Club for, too briefly and it was done in London by Glenda Jackson, a superb actress and she made a film of it in London and it was directed by a man named Robert Enders and he uh, was asked while the it was a good film, very good film. When uh, they were making that film, someone asked him, how are you going to open it up? He said, we're not going to open it up. We're going to open it in. And they did. But uh, there's no more uh, precise answer to that question, considering how many kinds of plays and films. The film of Mar Assad, for example, that Peter Brook also directed, is one of the best films I know of a play. And uh, I did a little TV, I did, did TV talks with a lot of people. I did one with him once in which he described how he had done it. Interesting. Uh, it leads to one other interesting point, if I may continue on this. What year is it? <laughs> we have time for one uh, more question after this. Okay. <laughs> What's that? I said we have time okay. for one more question after that. Uh, he said that they'd uh, found a studio. He, he used exactly the same cast that he'd used in the production, play in the theater, uh, which had uh, done the play for, they had done the play for, well, by that time, about two years. And uh, he found a studio in London, and with his lighting cameraman, he worked out all the kinds of light, a huge space, he worked out all the kinds of light that would be needed for every shot, close-ups, two shots, long shots, and so on, had them all prearranged in this vast barn of a place so that they didn't have to do what destroys the continuum of filmmaking so often, is to stop while the lights are being reset. And he simply moved his cast from one lighting area to another lighting area and did the whole film in 17 days, which is a phenomenal, phenomenally short time to make a film. Uh, and out of that came, out of that method came a um, wonderful replica of the theatrical effect of his production. Shortly after that, I had a letter from an English director who was going to make a film of one of the best new plays I've ever seen in my life, played by Athol Fugard called Bozeman and Lena. I'm not pronouncing it correctly. You should do it in South Africa. It's Bozeman and Lena or something like that. So many of you know it. It's uh, one of the best new plays I've ever seen. It's a, a play that I'm sure is going to last. Well, they, were going to make a, they wrote to me because I'd written something about the play. And Fugard had seen it and so on. And I remembered this Peter Brook uh, story of how he had done uh, Marassa. And Bozeman and Lena, if you remember, is a play with only three characters in one place. And I said, if you, if you ask me, I'll tell you. Uh, set your lights as you're going to need them for this and that moment in the play in advance. Fix the floor with caked, cracked mud and do the play and keep shooting it. Well, they did just the reverse. They went outdoors and they had tractors knocking down houses so these, and they had scenes of them walking along the road. They opened it up and they opened it into nothing. New name five plays that, have used, that you have seen in the last several years that you really enjoyed? I assume the person means plays and or productions. Or, or productions. Well, I've already named some of them. Uh, the Tempest. Uh, it's hard for me to do this because um, I, I don't 
pull things out of the air easily. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. I enjoyed, uh, with, I have severe reservations about it, but I enjoyed Fool for Love, Sam Shepard's recent play. True West comes out of the five-year span. Um, Dream Girls. Oh, we haven't talked about musicals at all. Uh, I thought, I didn't care much for the, uh, it's, it's, it's a Meyer Holdian production, you know, <laughs> in a certain sense. The score wasn't much, the book wasn't much, but what the theater did with it was marvelous, I thought. I think that's it. Have mercy. Yes, thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.